This is a book by Vicki Ruiz, Chapter 1, Border Journeys. The year is 1923, the place Gomez Palacios in the Mexican state of Durango as she watched her mother pack a few belongings. Jesueta Tornes was warned by her mother, Pascuela Esparza, not to tell anyone of their plans. Several days later, I'm sorry, several days later, shortly before noon, Pascuela would speak out of the family home with nine-year-old Jacita at her side and one-month-old Raquel in her arms. They heated for the train station with Pascuela, surveying the landscape for any signs of her husband or his relations. She must have breathed a sigh of relief as the train began its journey to Ciudad Juarez, from which she hoped to cross with her children into the United States. During her interview 70 years later, Sonora Torres would reveal that her stepfather, Raquel's biological father, in Gomez Palacios, had been cruel to her and her mother. In her words, I never knew my father. My mother got married again and things didn't work out. I guess they did not work because I was mistreated too, you know? So I think the only way she could get away was to come over here. Pascuela's intended to stay in Juarez until she had the money to secure passports for herself and her children. Her destination was El Monte, California, to live with her married sister. <clears throat> that same year, in, I'm sorry, that same year in the village of San Julian in the Los Altos region of Jalisco, Petra Sanchez made plans to return to the United States with her husband, Ramon. The three infants, two-year-old Guadalupe, one-year-old Labrado, and newborn Margarita, and five-year-old Jose, the son of Ramon and his late wife, Guadalupe Roca. The villagers of San Julian may have thought Petra and Ramon an unusual couple. Theirs had not been a conventional courtship. Ramon, late wife Guadalupe, had been Petra's older sister. When Guadalupe and her daughter Ampala succumbed to the global influenza outbreak of 1918, Ramon decided that he and Jose should live with the Rocas whether by choice or arrangements, Ramon and Petra married in 1920, and then the newlyweds journeyed to California, laboring as berry pickers in the vicinity of Buena Park. They hoped to make enough to return to San Julian with a nice nest egg. They arrived back <clears throat> to the village in 1923, but within a year, the couples decided to make California their home. Their second migration was marked by a tragedy when Ramon moved to, ahead to Buena Park, leaving his family temporarily behind with his brother. Baby Margarita died, and as Labrado would later recall to his niece, Marjoria Sanchez Walker, mother, was alone when Margarita died. By 1924, Ramon Petra and their increasing family worked in the fields of Knott's Berry Farm, about 50 miles to the north of El Monte. Pascuela and her daughter, Jesueta, would also be picking berries. Jesueta Torres and Petro Sanchez were part of the first modern wave of Mexican immigration to the United States. The society they entered was one only was one already marked by multiple conquests, migrations, and overlapping patriarchies, as previously mentioned. Spanish-speaking women migrated north from Mexico decades, even centuries before their Euro-American counterparts ventured west. Most arrived as the waves or daughters of soldiers, farmers, and artisans. Over the course of three centuries, they raised farm families or the frontier and worked alongside their fathers or husbands herding cattle and tending crops. <clears throat> Women's networks based on ties of blood and fic fictive kinship proved central to the settlement of the Spanish-Mexican frontier. 
At times, women settlers acted as midwives to mission. Indians baptized sick, sickly or stillborn babies. As godmothers for these infants, they established the bonds of the Drag Drasgo between Native American and Spanish Mexican women. However, exploitation took place among women. For those in domestic service, racial and class hierarchies undermined any pretense of sisterhood, while the godparent relationship could foster ties between colonists and Native Americans. Elites used baptism as a venue of social control. Indentured servitude was prevalent, prevalent on the colonial frontier and persisted well into the 19th century. Spanish-Mexican settlement has been shrouded by myth. Walt Disney's Zorro, for example, epitomized the notion of romantic California controlled by fun-loving, swashbuckling rancheros. Since only 3% of California Spanish-Mexican population could be considered rancheros in 1850, most women did not preside over large estates, but helped manage small family farms. Married women on the Spanish-Mexican frontier had certain legal advantages not afforded by their Euro-American peers. Under English common law, women, when they married, became femme, femme covert or dead in the eyes of the legal system and thus could not own property separate from their husbands. Conversely, Spanish-Mexican women remained retained control of their land after marriage and one held and held one half interest in the community property they shared with their spouses. Life for the Mexican settlers changed dramatically in 1848 with the conclusion of the U.S.-Mexican War. The discovery of gold in California and the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, Mexicans on the U.S. side of the border became second-class citizens divested in of their property and political power there would turned up their world would turn turned upside down segregated from euro-american population mexican americans in the barrios of the southwest sustained their sense of identity and cherished their traditions with little property for advancement mexicans were concentrated in lower eclin industries service and agricultural jobs a few elite families, especially in New Mexico, retained their land and social standing. This period of conquest, physical and ideological, did not occur in a dispassionate environment. Stereotypes affected rich and poor alike, with Mexicans commonly described as lazy, sneaky, and greasy in Euro-American journals, novels, and travelogues. Spanish-speaking women were frequently depicted as flashy, morally dis deficient sirens, providing insight into community life, 19th century Spanish language. Newspaper revealed ample information on social mores, I'm sorry, social norms, mores. Newspaper editors have held the double standard. Women were to be cloistered and protected to the extent that some residents of New Mexico and Arizona protested the establishment of co-educational public schools. Despite prevailing conventions, con con yeah, conventions, most Mexican women, because economic circumstances sought employment for wages, whether in cities or on farms, family members pooled their earnings to put food on the table. Women worked at home, taking in laundry borders and sewing, while others worked in the fields, in restaurants and hotels, and in canaries and laundries. As slaters, cousins, and camaraderies, women relied on one another for mutual support, in other words, of New Mexico native Bob Fabiola Cabeza de Baca. The women had to be resourceful in every way. They were their own doctors, dressmakers, tailors, and advisors. Wage work and mutual assistance were, were survival strategies that persisted well into the 20th century across region and generation. Between 1910 and 1930, over one million Mexicans, one eighth of, to one tenth of Mexico's population migrated, 
I'm sorry, Al Altro Lado, arriving in the United States, often with their dreams and little else. These immigrants settled into existing communities and created new ones in the Southwest and Midwest. 1,900 from 375,000 to perhaps as many as 500,000 Mexicans lived in the Southwest. Within a short space of 20 years, Mexican Americans were outnumbered at least two to one and their colonies became immigrant enclaves. In some areas, this transformation appeared more, even more dramatic. Los Angeles, for example, had a Mexican population ranging from 3,000 to 5,000 in 1900. By 1930, approximately 150,000 people of a Mexican birth or heritage resided in the city's expanding barrios. As David Gutierrez has so persuasively argued, immigration from Mexico in the 20th century has had profound consequences for Mexican Americans in terms of daily decisions about who they are politically, socially, and culturally. In comparison, to more recent immigrants from Mexico, indeed a unique layering of generations has occurred in, with it, in which ethnic racial identities take many forms. From the Hispanos of New Mexico and Colorado, whose roots go back to the 18th century, to the recently arrived who live as best they can in the canyons of northern San Diego County. Such heterogeneous Mexican community is not new. Throughout the 20th century, a layering of generations can be de detected in schools, churches, community organizations, work sites, and neighborhoods. Writing about San Bern Bernardino, in the 1940s, Ruth Tech offered the following illustration. There is a street on which three families live side by side. The head of one family is nat a naturalized citizen who arrived here 18 years ago. The head of the second is an alien who came in 1905. The head of the third is the descendant of people who, who came in 1843. All of them with their families live in poor housing, earn approximately $150 a month as unskilled laborers, send their children to Mexican schools and encounter the same sort of discriminatory practices. Inheriting a legacy of colonism, colonialism wrought by manifest destiny, destiny Mexicans, regardless of cap, of native, native, Nativity, nativity, <laughs> sorry, found themselves segmented into low paying, low status jobs with few opportunities for advancement. Living in segregated barrios, they formed neighborhood associations and church groups and created a community life prededicated on modes of production, economic and cultural. This chapter surveys women women's border journeys, first in terms of migration and settlement, followed by patterns of daily life. The ways in which Warner, as farm worker mothers, railroad wives, and miners' daughters negotiated a variety of constraints, economic, racial, and patriarchal, are at the heart of the narrative Mexican Canas claimed a space for themselves and their families, building community through mutual assistance. While struggling for some, I'm sorry, semblance, I'm so sorry, of financial stability, especially in the middle of rising nativitist sentiment that would exist, that would crest in the deportions and reportations of the early 1930s. Whether living in a labor camp, boxcar settlement, binding town, or urban barrio, Mexican women nurtured families, worked for wages, built fictive kin networks, and participated in formal and informal community associations. Through chain and circular migrations of families, community and kin networks intertwined. In Riverside, California, for example, the East Side Barrio by the 1960s had so many members of single extended family that Ray Barrio recalled how he and his buddies had to venture into the rival Barrio Casa Blanca to get dates. 
Chain and circular migrations, of course, begin with the act of crossing the political border separating Mexico and the United States. In writing the history of Mexican immigration, scholars general, generally work within a push-pull model. What material co... co sorry, this printing is really bad. What material co... Consa, Constitutions facilitated migration and what expectations did people carry that with them as their journey north? Between 1875 and 1910, the Mexican birth rate soared, resulting in a 50% increase in population. Food prices also spiraled, while dictator Porfirio Diaz has been credited with the modernization of Mexico's economic economic policies decimated the lives of the Mexican rural vill villagers as they were displaced from the their Ijotos communal land holding by commercial, often corporate America agricultural interest. Perhaps as many as 5 million people lost access to their ancestral lands. In the words of his historian, Diva Weber, the independent Mexican peasantry disappeared, and by 1910, over nine and a half million people, 96% of Mexican families, were landless. By 1900, American built and financed railroads offered mass transportation. <clears throat> mass transportation in Mexico. Since the major rail lines ran north and south to make connections with lines on the US, U.S. side, hopping a train to the border was a realistic and accessible option. Beginning with the, the Madero Uprising of 1910, the Mexican Revolution also spurred migration to the United States, claiming the lives of an estimated one or to two million people. This 10-year biopsy blotchy civil war wrecked economic politics and social chaos. Starvation was not unknown and danger a constant companion. Marauders and soldiers raped and kidnapped young women. Elsie Gonzalez recalled how her grandmother had protected her sister from soldiers by throwing a wicker hamper over her and sitting on top of it until the men had left. The solderos, whether as wives, sweethearts, or paid service workers, or as women who fought in their right in their own right, units, shouldered multiple responsibilities in the course of a single day. Although only eight years old when Diaz was routed from power, in 1911, Lucia R. had clear memories <clears throat> of the soldados. They used to carry the whole house on their backs. In addition, they carried the small children and a rifle in case they had to tangle with the enemy, too. In a bucket, they carried what was necessary to cook. Toward the end of the day, they would stop and set up camp and start dinner. Pobrosities they suffered a lot. Pro, pro, Pobercitas, they suffered a lot. I'm sororry. Although hostilities for the most part would cease in 1920, the economic aftershock never <sighs> reverberated throughout the following decade. In addition, the Cristero revolt prompted further immigration from 1925 to 1929. Several scholars have referred to the United States as a safety valve for Mexicans seeking to escape the ravages of war. This metaphor is a good one, not only for com campesinos and artisan, but for government officials, professionals, and wealthy. Taking no chances, Senor Areza, the mayor of Guadalupe, I Calvo Chihuahua wisely sent his wife and children to El Paso. He would never see his cherished family again as assassinations would take his wife life during the course of the revolution. Immigrants looked to the United States as a source of hope and employment. They soon discovered that material conditions did not match their expectations. The early quantitative studies of 
Albert Camero, Ricardo Roma, and Mario Berea sharply illuminated the economic and social stratification of Mexicana in the Southwest during the early decades of the 20th century. As examples in the 1930, the three most common occupations for Mexican men were in agriculture, 45% manufacturing, 24% and transportation, 13%. Only 1% held professional positions. Women wage earners could frequently be found in the service sector, 38%. In blue collar employment, 25%, in, and in agriculture, 21%. Only 3% were considered professionals, and 10% held clerical or sales positions. <clears throat> the following discussions sketches out in the broad strokes of the occupational niches of Mexican immigrants <clears throat> and their families in the United States. With the advent of the of reclaim reclamation and irrigation projects and World War I commercial agriculture in the Southwest boomed at the same time that restrictive mandates against Asian immigrants contributed to a relatively diminished supply of workers. Growers av avidly recruited Mexicans promenading, promising wages that seemed extraordinary to com compasinos. Lawrence Cardoso indicated that in the in Mexico, Field workers could earn 12 cents per day while the U.S. Southwest daily wages for similar work range from $1 to $3.50. By 1930, according to the U.S. Chamber of Com Commerce report, Mexican agricultural workers earned from $2.75 to $6 per day. The Utah-Idaho Sugar Company contracted dated March 14, 1918, Signed by Severino Rodriguez, stipulated that workers would be paid $7 per acre for blocking and thinning, $2.50 and $1.50 acre for the first and second hoeing, and ten or I'm sorry, $10 per acre for pulling, topping, and loading sugar beets. The honoring of such wages could be another matter altogether. In 1919, a representative of the Mexican <clears throat> ambassador to the United States would call on the Commissioner General Immigration to investigate the physical conditions of com compatriots employed by the Utah-Idaho Sugar Company. Based on materials the Mexican embassy had received from Senor Rodriguez, in which he explained that 500 families have been left in every precarious altar precarious situation. Mexicans provided the sinew and muscle and branches and farms throughout the West. Historian Camille Guerin Gonzalez indicates that by 1920 Mexicans farmed the largest single ethnic group among farm workers in California and during the 1920s they became the mainstay of California's large-scale specialty agricultural Pioneers Economic Paul Taylor found in the newest uh, county, Texas, that Mexicans far farmed 97% of the farm labor. Labor force in Arizona, 80% of the year-round or resident farm workers were me Mexican. Migration into the Pacific Northwest and Rocky Mountains. Rocky Mountain State, Spanish-speaking workers could also be found in such dis disparate places as Nice, Oregon, Blackfoot, Idaho, and Green River. Wyoming farming over 65% of sugar har beet harvest harvesters. Mexican communities also emerge in Michigan and Minnesota. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce related that by then by 1930s, Mexicans picked more than 80% of the perishable commodities produced in the Southwest. The railroads also provided employment. According to Jeff Garfonzo, <clears throat> Mexican Mexicanos composed from about 50 to 70% of the track crews on the major Western lines. 
Labor contractors for both agriculture and the railroads traveled to the interior of Mexico to recruit workers holding out such inducements as high wages, free transportation, and housing. More frequently, such agents competed with one another in the border city of El Paso. The border journey of the Viasca's family serves as an example recruited by Rock Island Railroad in Simola, Guanajuato in 1907, Felix Vasquez and his wife, Frederic, made their way north. Their first two children were born in Mexico and then a daughter, Ieba, in El Paso. Laboring on the track, Vasquez with his family migrated from Boxcar Colonia to Boxcar Colonia in Arizona, New Mexico, Iowa, Kansas, where they celebrated the birth of another daughter and then settled in Silvis, Illinois, outside Chicago, the birthplace of four younger children. The boxcar communities could move at a moment's notice or become permanent settlements. Midwest rail, rail lines also relied on Mexican labor since over 40% of their workers in the Chicago Gary region were Mexican in 1927. Wages in the rail yards of Detroit averaged $4 per day, and Mexican rail bands could be found as far east as Pittsburgh. Mining and industrial jobs were another were other pole occupations. By 1910, Arizona had become the nation's number one producer of copper, and the Rockefellers, a Colorado Fuel and Iron Company, had irrevocably altered the southern Colorado landscape with coal mines in both states. A layering of generations occurred, similar to urban areas of the southwest with Mexicano migrations migrants living and working alongside native-born Mexican-Americans. By the mid-1920s, daily wages averaged from $2.75 to $4.95 for Mexican miners in Arizona. Heavy industry in the Midwest also recruited Mexican labor with the Bethlehem Steel and in Pennsylvania, the most notable example in the Southwest construction firms depended on Mexicanos. In Mexican immigration to the United States, 1930s, anthropologist Manuel Gamio indicated that many orders to Mexico originated from such places like such places as Nebraska and New York. The grandfather of the Chicano artist Yolanda Lopez, for example, made his living as a tailor in New York City. As Francesco Baldorzama and Ra Raymond Rodriguez astutely, I think that's astutely, yeah, astutely observed by the late, by the 1920s, Mexicans could be found harvesting sugar beets in Minnesota layering track in Kansas, packing meat in Chicago, mining coal in Oklahoma homes, assembling cars in Detroit, canning fish in Alaska, and sharecropping in Louisiana. Migration within the United States was common and Vasquez family journey to Sylvia exemplifies the stepping stone, to, stepping stone route to the Midwest. However, most new arrivals lingered closer to the border Coming from every Mexican state with a substantial proportional from central plateau regions of Mex Micochon, Jalisco, and Guanajuato, 80% of this population by 1930 lived in the states of Texas, California, New Mexico, Arizona, and Colorado. The experiences of women who journeyed north alone or only in the company of children have received scant scholarly attention. In separation studies, however, Debra Weber and I have found numerous examples of women like Pascuela Esparza, who arrived al otro lado on their own. Manuel Garnillo also documents their experiences here and there. In his field notes housed at the Boncroft Library, as well as expert in expert excerpts, oh my goodness gracious, I'm so sorry, published in this life, 
story of the Mexican immigrant. This records the Immigration and Naturalization Service, especially the transcripts of the boards of special inquiry, land insight into the lives of those who came as solar or as single mothers. Gender marked one's reception at the Stanton Street Bridge linking Ciudad, Ciudad Juarez and El Paso, especially if one ventured alone. Men would hear the competing pitches of labor contractors promising high wages and escorted benefits. Con conversely, immigration inspectors routinely stopped their those considered likely to be con come as a public charge. In other words, solas and single mothers agents scrutinized passports, applications, and conducted special hearings to determine women's eligibility eligibility for entrance into the United States. Arriving in Ciudad with a nine-year-old daughter and a four-week-old infant, Pascuala Esparza discovered she did not have the necessary funds to obtain the proper passports in El Paso. So she stayed in Ciudad Juarez, finding a job as a housekeeper and a room in a boarding house. The landlady promised to look in on her daughters while Pas Pasquela worked. However, it was nine-year-old Jesuits who shouldered the responsibility for herself and her sister. Jerisita remembered that as part of her daily routine, she would carry Raquel a long distance to an affluent home where their mother worked. After preparing the noon meal for her employer, Pasquela would anxiously wait by the kitchen door when her children arrived. She quickly and quietly ushered them into the kitchen. While nursing Raquel, she fed Jesuit a burrito of leftovers. Then Jesuita would take her baby sister into her arms and trek back to the boarding house to await their mother's return. In the evening, only one can only imagine her fears as she negotiated the streets of a strange city, a hungry child carrying a hungry baby after six months. Pasquales had made enough money to complete the journey to California. Immigration agents, however, still remain suspicious of a woman unaccompanied by a man. On their next attempt, to cross, even with the cash in hand, Pasquela and her family were denied regular passports. Desperate but not helpless, she secured a local passport generally reserved for Juarez residents who worked in El Paso. And in that way, she <clears throat> and her children crossed the border. Another strategy employed by women involved direct confrontation with immigration officers. Journalist Reed rec recorded in an incident in which a woman was quarreled about the con contents of her rebozo. She slowly opened the front of her dress and answered placidly, I don't know, senor. It may be a... I don't know, glean, and it may be a, oh, it may be a girl, and it may be a boy, during a board of special inquiry in Nogales, Arizona. 24-year-old Trinidad Orleane refused to be intimidated as she found her 14-year-old sister, Beatrice, attempted to join their mother and two sisters who worked as sectors, as actors at the Star Theater in El Paso. People, perhaps aware of the suspicion w with which actors were held, Trinidad adopted a defiant stance. A portion of her testimony follows. Oriana, no, my brother is not an actor, hearing officer. What is he? Oriana, he is a manic mechanic, hearing officer. What kind of a mechanic? Orly Oriolani. You ask him. Shortly after this exchange, an exasperated immigration agent declared, Do you want to answer these questions or do you want to stop right now? Appearing as within as a witness, her brother Alfonso took a different 
differential position, emphasizing the strong transnational family bond, his fitness as a breadwinner, and his desire to, for U.S. citizenship in granting the Oriolani sisters admit, admittance, the transcript reveals an odd rationale for Trinidad's testimony. It was thought at first from the ma manner of answering that there was something wrong, but the Beard family decided that she was just ignored or frightened. There is nothing in her appearance that to indicate that she is connected to the theatrical profession or anything other than a plain seamstress as she claims to be. Whether Trini Trinidad or Lenny's performance, unquote, at the hearing had been carefully scripted or not, it seems interesting that she and her brother articulated reverse gender expectations, the assertive he accommodating as significant immigration agents attributed her unsettling testimony to being scared or backward rather than as a direct challenge to their authority. Perhaps being caught off guard worked to the sister's advantage. For three weeks later, the El Paso office would chastise the Nogales agents for making such a hasty decisions with respect to the Orellanes. The Immigration Act of 1917, which included provisions for a literacy test and a head tax, made circulatory migration more difficult. Historian George Santos contends the that these measures, along with harassment by border agents, contributed to a pattern of more permanent settlement, especially after its passage, immigrants arriving in El Paso, the Ellis Island for Mexicans, encountered disgruntling and demeaning, and demeaning reception. According to Bateronima and Rodriguez, all immigrants, men, women, and children were herded into crowded examination pens. As many as 500 to 600 persons were detained for there for endless hours without benefit of drinking fountains or toilet facilities. Immigrants were also required to remove their clothing to hand over to officials for disinfecting. They received medical examinations and were there, then herded through a public bath. Association Immigrants with outbreaks of influenza, border agents perceived themselves as acting in the public interest, but for the individuals undergoing such treatment, the humiliation remained a searing memory. They disinfected us with uh, disinfected us uh, us as if we were some kind of animals. Sanchez points out that this process was reserved only for poor migrants. Professional and elite exiles are those who dressed to pass above their class, could forego the literacy test, medical examination, and a public bath. <clears throat> like those who arrived in Europe and Asia, Mexican immigrants dreamed of a better life. Some were pro propelled by fantastic images of prosperity or a, as a verse on, from a popular corrido proclaimed, for they told me that here the dollars were scattered about heaps, in, about in, the, in heaps, that there were girls and theaters and that here everything was good and fun, unquote. The manufacturer's fantasies of Hollywood also appealed to advent, adventurous young women like Elisa Silva, divorcing an abusing husband abusive husband, Silva, her mother, and two sisters left Me Metal Mestalen for Los Angeles with the hopes of, quote, working as extras in the movies, unquote. However, once they arrived, they found work in different occupations. One sister worked as a seamstress, another a attended business college, and Elisa earned 20 to $30 a week as a, quote, dime a dance partner in the, a local Mexican dance hall. Other two other women, like Pascual Esparza, were not motivated by promises of fame and fortune. Survival was their goal. And for many, the agricultural communities of Texas, California, and the Far West would be <clears throat> their new homes. After the grueling journey, Pascuala and her children resided with her sister, 
sister's family in El Monte, El Monte, California, living under the one roof with her ties, ticks, with her ticks and her cousins. Jesuita and her mother worked in the Berry fam fields from February through June, then journeyed with their relatives to San Joaquin Valley, where they would first pick grapes, then cotton. By November, they extended fam the extended family would return to Amante. We didn't work November, December, January, but we used to buy our sack of beans and we'd get our flour and we'd get our coffee and we'd get our rice so that we could live on those for th those three months. We didn't work. It is a truism that family networks are central to American immigration history, but as I listened to Jesuita Torres, I wondered how observers like 1930s soci sociologist Ruth Allen could have missed, missed the complexities of extended family life when they interviewed Mexican farm workers. Indeed, Allen seemed to equate the fact that <clears throat> since growers paid the wages of all the family members in a lump sum, to the head of the household, such arrangements sat well in the minds of Mexican women, whom she believed clung to traditions of fe fe feminine subservience. With thinly veiled contempt, Allen wrote, the Mexican women had been taught as her guide to conduct the vow of the Mes Mesitos, where thou goest i will go up and down the road she follows the men of her family the modern women movement and demands for economic de independence Sorry. have left her untouched unaccompaniedly she labors in the field for months at a, a time and receives as a reward from the head of the family some Goo, 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 from the five and ten cent store, or at best a new dress. The supremacy of males is seldom disputed. The ethnocentric <clears throat> per perceptions of this Texas professor signifies one end of the spectrum. On the opposite end reside rosy notions of happy extended families while family and fictive kin may have tased the migrant journey and provided physical and emotional sucker human relationships are rarely perfect i am so sorry guys this printing is really horrible indeed i too may be guilty of casting a fairly uncritical eye on extended family Red, what is that? Networks? Networks in com Comrie Women, Cannery Women, Cannery Lives. Bear in mind that the dynamics of power permeate the realm of decision making, whether one is situated at work or at home. We must move beyond celebration of his family, familia to address questions of power and patriarchy. The gender politics of work and family. Gender politics, however, is also enmeshed in economic and social stratification. Women like Jes Jesuita Torres and her mother, Pascuela, lived and worked in extended family relationships, often be necessity rather than choice. It is not until Pascuela secured employment at a walnut factory that she could save a portion of her wages and move her daughters and grandson out of her sister and brother-in-law's home. Although Senora Torres remembered that when you live together, you think they, that they love you and you love them. She also revealed that her uncle's drinking talk a toil on the family we couldn't sleep because they had to do their singing and their cussing and we had a little corner in the kitchen 
where we slept. Wheela Luna Mount remembered her family's going walnut picking with a friend of a friend. In her words, we slept on the floor in the living room. We suffered humiliation because we had really no place to go. And they made us feel very unwelcome. Individuals' memories illuminate community histories. The following narrative me reveals Mexican women's stories across region and occupation, examining their lives in agricultural colonies, boxcar burritos, and mining towns, of, and focusing in part on the cultural construction of class. Just as women's work and family roles were intertwined, so too they were the racial and economic and patriarchal constraints they faced. Their legacy of resistance reveal the resi resi resiliency, determination, and strength. A lifelong farm of nursery and nursery workers, Jesuita Torres stated simply, it's hard when you don't have an education. You go to work and you always have to do the hardest work. I used to think if I ever have children, I'm going to work so hard. Many children will never have to do this. Migrant workers, both past and present, have occupied a vulnerable, precarious sector of the working class. Indeed, as an underclass of monopoly ca capitalism, frequently invisible in labor camps off the beaten track, farm workers have in general labored for for low w wages under hazardous conditions and with substandard housing and provisions. While individual, individual qualities such as physical stamina and fortitude seem necessary for survival, a collective sense of family, neighborhood, and cultural bonds created thriving colonies among Mexican agricultural workers. In labor and community historian Gilbert Gonzalez meticulously reconstructs citrus communities in Orange County, Colonia residents may have depended on the grow growers for their livelihoods, but they developed their own local village structures and organizations, ones imbued with what Emilio Zarnaza has termed an all-inclusive Mexicanist identity rooted in nationalism and working class values of fraternalism, reciprocity reciprocity and altruism. As Devra Weber argues in Dark Sweat, White Gold, segregation, working class status, and the ge <clears throat> geographic mobility of Mexican men and women reinforced their identity as Mexicans and reaffirmed the need to rely on each other in an Anglo- dominated society. She continued while aspects of mutual aid underlie any society, the importance of reciprocity was more powerful among immigrants. But there is more to the story than collective identity for the po the parlor of patriarchy must also be considered in exploring the lives of women agricultural workers. Rosalinda G Gonzalez contended contends that the organization of farm labor reinforced patriarchal tendencies within families. Women could labor for the patron at work and the patron at home. However, like their foremothers who migrated north du during their frontier era, the frontier era, Mexicanas created their own worlds of influence pre prededicated on women's networks, on ties of familia and fictive Ken Kamadrazga served as one of the undergirdings for general patterns of reciprocity as women cared for one another as family and neighbors. As an example, Irene C Castafita recalled her mother's efforts as a midwife in South Texas. Mother from seeing the poor people die for lack of medics Attention wanted to do something to help them, and she learned as she beat best as she could to deliver babies, sometimes on the floor with just a small blanket. Sometimes she would bring pillows or blankets from home. Many of the women had not eaten. She would bring them 
rice from home and feed them by spoonfuls. The shots were a cup of hot pepper tea to give strength for the baby to be born. The family remained the, the unit of production and in agricultural labor for wives and mothers. The day began before sunrise as they prepared the mass masa, masa for fresh tortillas in an interview with Gilbert Gonzalez. Julia Hagueras Aguares remembered how her mother prepared tortillas on top of a steel barrel that she had improvised as a stove. As a child, Clement Clemente Laneras worked at, with a short handle hoe in the beet fields of Montana. He recalled a, the double day existence of his mother who labored all day in the fields and returned to a full evening of chores. After dinner, she would work in the washing board and tub. She had to heat the water on the stove and if there wasn't enough if there wasn't room for the water, she would heat water outside on a fire. He continued she would spend half the night so she would be ready to go back to work the next morning. Trying on a 1923 Department of Labor study, <clears throat> sociologist Mary Romero and Eric Marguias illuminate the double day among campesinos in the Col Colorado beet fields. Only 14 of the 454 working mothers interviewed were relieved by other adults in the cooking and only 42 women were assisted by a child. Paid by the acre, bin, or burlap bag, workers had their earnings tied to their abilities to pick with speed and skill, careful not to bruise the berries or puncture the tomatoes. Mothers with infants were not common were not uncommon sights. Grace Luna related how women would scale ladders with a hundred pounds of cottons on their back and some carried their kids on top of their packing sacks. While Luna picked cotton in Madeira, California, Maria Ardondo worked in a peach orchard little more than an hour's distance near the small town of Delhi, reflecting on her experience as a young mother. Coping with the realities of migrant life, she revealed, 1944, we camped in Delhi under trees and orchards in tents. We made a home. We had ro rocks already or bricks and cooked our food and got boxes for our table. Martiz, her son, suffered a, he remembers, picking peaches was the hardest job. I used to cry because my neck hurt. The big peaches were heavy. I could only care, fill the bag halfway because I couldn't stand the pain. We lived not too far the bosses and that is where we used to get our water restrooms they were under the trees in the field or by the canal <sighs> migrant farm workers had little shelter from the excrements of heat or cold with no labor camp in sight jesuita torres dusted herself off and slept under trees Clemente Linares recalled how the Montana winters would freeze the outdoor water pumps, but the ever present snow which sweeped into the house from the cracks in the walls did serve as his family's main source of water. Telling his daughter Lydia that the per proverbial story of walking over two miles to school in the snow, he declared that you didn't freeze to death was a miracle. Conversely, in the poem, I remember Isabel Flores presents a limpid image of the life in the fields on a hot summer day. A portion follows. I remember riding on my mother's sack, mother's saca as she picked cotton in the middle of two circles donchas tortillas he for hillies in an opened field with dust and wind i remember watching a cloud slowly covering the sur and giving thanks for the minutes of shade 
Some children never made it into the fields. In 1938, a Michigan newspaper reported how in the beet fields, knees near Blissville Company housing amounted to hovels with 15 to 20 workers assigned to each shack. Babies were born in tents or outside under trees. One infant died shortly after birth. The mother had stood in a crowd, flat, a crowded flatbed truck all the way from San Antonio, Texas to Michigan, and on her arrival went into, went into labor prematurely. A single headline from a Michigan paper says it all. West po want poverty, misery, terror ride through Michigan sugar beet fields. Like four horsemen, Mexican labor brought like cattle to state in trucks. Nameless graves, unmarked fields. I'm sorry. <laughs> Rural migrant women had, a, had few choices other than picking produce. Some became cooks and labor camps and other ran, others ran makeshift boarding houses. In addition to picking produce, caring for her family and serving as the local midwives, Irene Castan Castaneda, mother, took in laundry for which she earned $5 per week. Working as a housekeeper for a local farm and merchant families offered another option, but domestic labor frequently contains the hidden psycho psycho psychological costs of prejudice, discrimination, and humiliation. Paul Taylor recorded the following observations from Euro-American women in South Texas regarding their Mexican servants. They are good domestic servants if you train them right. They are getting better and are clean if you teach them to be. We feel toward the Mexican like the old Southerners South, Southerners toward the Negroes. Some of us have had servants from the same family for the three generations. In the, oh my goodness gracious. In the racist of a family tragedy, Jesuita Torres learned that she definitely preferred migrant work over household employment. At the age of 15, Jesuita eloped with a young man she met in the fields and a year later became a mother. At 17, Jesuita, pregnant with her second child, had been abandoned by her 24-year-old husband. Moving back in with her mother and relatives, she packed carrots and spinach for a while, but then tried working as a live-in housekeeper. Her mother would care for her toddler and son and newborn. Child, I want to do housework, and they did not pay me too much, and I had to stay there, so I did not like it. When Jesuita baby cried, her employer helped her promise a proper... Oh, I'm so sorry. When her baby died, her employer helped her promise a proper burial. Senora Torres, however, learned that this assistance was neither an act of charity nor kindness, but an advance she would have to pay back. In her words, that lady helped me to, bu to bury him because was I was working for her, so after I got through paying her what I owed her, then I quit. How could this Petrona be so heartless? Writing about a woman of color in domestic service, sociologist Evelyn Nikina Glenn examines both the structural mechanism of a dual labor system and the played out of gendered identities and ideologies within the employer employee interpersonal interactions that characterize such work. She theorizes the actions of employers in the following terms. Racial characterizations effectively neutralize the racial ethnic women's womanhood, allowing the mistress to be unaware of domestic relationships to her own children and household. Nikino Glenn continues the exploitation of racial ethnic women's physical, emotional, and mental work for the benefit of white 
households thus could be rendered invisible and conscious, if not in reality. Migrant women, whether they labored in the fields or someone else's kitchen, conserved scarce fam familial resources within their own households. They tended subsistence gardens and raised poultry and other barnyard animals. At times, grandparents and children assured I'm sorry, assumed, assumed responsibility for the herbs, vegetables, and chickens. Clemente Linares remembers helping his 86-year-old grandfather around the yard. We raised tomatoes, peas, beans, cabbage, carrots in order to have a root cellar to help provide us through the winter. And of course, we tried to have hog or two to butcher, maybe a calf, and had our chickens, such activities lessen dependence on local merchants and company store. As Sarah Deutsch has argued, much a such a mixed economy enabled Hispanos in New Mexico and Colorado a measure of independence. Yet once they left the land, they lost their the end that independence. Romero and Margot. Margo Voice explained that when these three, when these farmers left their land, dry land farms in southern Colorado or northern New Mexico to answer the call of the growers and the sugar beet companies, it was a critical step in their transformation from present farmers to wage workers. They continued by the end of the depression, the dignity of wage work had been wrested from them and they had been reduced to under a underemployed wards of, of the state. Whether underemployed, un, unemployed, or even employed putting food on the table was a full-time occupation, especially during the Depression. In California, fields migrant workers of all ethnicities, Euro-Americans, African-Americans, Filipino, and Mexicans, lived on the brink of starvation. John Steibrick described a typical diet in good times as beans, baking powder, biscuits, jam, coffee, and in bad dandelion greens and boiled potatoes, similarly. Maria Ardenindo recalled, we didn't have enough food. We had beans, very little meat, mixed with potatoes and sopa. In her article on the San Joaquin Valley cotton strike of 1933, Devora Weber tellingly points to the importance of food women's food in women's daily lives with memories of want and edi of want and edibly etched in their consciousness quote men remembered the strike in terms of wages and conditions women remembered the ter the events in terms of food for some resistance the to exploitation took the fo form of labor Activism for others escape seemed the only option. A single case study taken from the INS records can serve to show fortitude and courage. It concerns over 150 Mexican immigrants recruited to pick sugar beets by the Utah Idaho Sugar Company, only to find the management failed to abide by the term of terms of con contracts and recruited immigrants were left to fend for themselves without coal or food in the in the bleak uh, Idaho winter. As mentioned earlier, one of the workers, Sev Severiano Rodriguez, had ap appealed to the Mexican ambassador to intervene on their behalf. In addition, a local priest brought their plight to the country to the county commissioners who authorized, I'm sorry, the distribution of a thousand pounds of flour and one ton of cold as well as re a relief allotment of $165 to be divided among 16 of the neediest families. The county commission then sought compensation from the sugar beet farm. A subsequent immigrant service investigated, investigation absolved the Utah-Idaho Sugar Company from any wrongdoing, referring the two company representatives as intelligible, intelligent and capable men. The investigation agent believed that incidences 
of suffering had been exaggerated in a classical example of scapegoating. He chastised the Mexicanos for not bringing along proper clothes and bedding for an Idaho winter and no saving enough of their wages to carry them through the spring. Although he realized that the workers would be charged for such supplies, he seemed bewildered that they, they turned down company offers of blankets and mattresses. The migrants had already accumulated a substantial debt, beginning with the company charges for transportation to Idaho, and though in great want they were determined to avoid further employer claims to their labor. During the investigation, the Utah-Idaho Sugar Sugar Beet Company also made assurances that the Mexican immigrants would henceforth receive adequate supplies of food and fuel. Although the local government had donated some provisions, Mexicana were not welcome as they were perceived as carriers of influenza, and even the Immigration Service acknowledged that at least seven migrants had succumbed to the epidemic. Having little resources, Having little recourse and probably fewer re resources, 32 people, men, women, and children gathered their belongings and fled the labor camp. Like the African-American slaves who took, took a chance on the Underground Railroad, these Mexican immigrants, 21, were members of a single extended family. The Bent Benton Courts made a desperate break for freedom, behaving like a modern-day Plantas, the Utah-Idaho Sugar Company, appeal, appealed to immigration authorities for assistance in ap apprehending those whom the firm perceived as breaking their contracts with their feet. Labeling them deserters, a company official wrote, I understand that some of the people are in Potalika, Idaho, but have reason to believe some of them have gone to Elko, Nevada. Resistance to, ec resistance to economic exploitation could also take the form. Oh my goodness, this one's really bad too. I'm so sorry, guys. Ethnic community building in the citrus belt of the Southern California. Mexican immigrants established colonies or villages complete with their own organizations and institutions forming patriotic associations, mutual aid groups, church societies, and baseball teams, Mexican immigrants created a rich, semi-autonomous life for themselves. In historian Gilbert Gonzalez's words, the village was home, neighborhood, playground, and social center. The length of the citrus season promoted the development I'm sorry of Orange County colonies and Riverside Barrios. With employment available in the groves eight months out of the year, citrus workers had spatial stability and in contrast to transient or contract labor. During the off season, late summer, early fall, citrus families would often make the migrant circuit north picking grapes and cotton in the San Joaquin Valley or perhaps heading southeast, southeast to the rich agricultural fields near Cochilla. However, they had home and community awaiting for their return. For Uzbieta Vasquez de Barrio, Our Lady of Guadalupe Shrine has been at the center of her life for over 30, 60 years. She recalled how the Mexican neighbors chipped in to build their own church in the middle of the depression. We worked real hard to have our church. The people were all poor, worse than we are now, but everything came up real nice, so we are very proud of that church. Citrus communities res represented a collective identity and a sense of belonging for its Members, or as Gilbert Gonzalez stated, within these villages, workers constructed their vision of a good society. Conditions of migrant life were not confined to agricultural labor. Railroad workers and their families traveled from one boxcar burrito to another. While men went off to the tracks, women in 
endeavored to make the boxcar a home and to nurture ties with their neighbors. When newcomers arrived in Berlin, New Mexico, for example, Warner, I'm sorry, yeah, Warner met with the crew trains offering their assistance to the passengers. Frederica Vasquez recalled to her grandson, Ray Burial, how less senoras when, went out to meet them and brought them food and brought them clothing and made them feel welcome, very welcome. According to historian Jeffrey Gossoflazo, box, boxcar communities probably represented the most common form of housing, common form of housing the, for Mexican workers and their families. Some were rolling villages in that families traveled with the particular shelters while other settlements were composed of boxcars with the wheels removed. The company provided wood-burning stoves and at times outdoor sanitation, sanitation facilities. However, one Kansas man stated that the outhouses have only had two seats for 30 people. Given the isolation of many of these settlements, families often had little choice but to... Oh my goodness, this is even worse. But to buy their staples from the company commissary, like the contract laborers employed by the Utah-Idaho Sugar Company, track families could become entangled in a web of debt pat pinage. Nothing the high price charged by the company store. The wife of a Southern Pacific rail worker, Juan Caldon declared, we cannot save any money, always in debt, so we will probably always stay with the company, unquote. As, the as in the case of farm, farm workers, substance gardener, gardens and barnyard animals could ease resilience on the company store as well as provide fresh produce, dairy products, and meat. Women and children tended to the chickens and goats, pulled weeds, and nurtured seedlings. One can only imagine their frustration if their husbands were transformed to another section as they gathered their belongings and livestock, leaving the gardens for other families to harvest. A single boxcar often housed more than one family, generally two, sometimes more. Families sweltered and the Arizona heat and shivered in an Illinois winter. Referring to the railroad settlement of Silvus, Silvus, Illinois, a Reader's Digest article related, when the Mexicans in their boxcars woke up in the wintertime, children had to break ice in the wash bowls before they could clean up for a school. Healthcare, moreover, was a vital concern. People frequently sh frequently relied on cur curas, those in the community with knowledge of traditional medicine, doctors and hospitals, were not readily accessible. Frederica Vasquez would lose two daughters in Sylvia, one to whooping cough and another in to pneumonia. Railroad wives, like migrant workers, could also find making ends meet a difficult problem proposition to supplement their spouse's incomes they took in sewing laundry borders even babies some women earned money or food for the families by wet nursing neighborhood infants as gregora sos sos a railroad worker's wife from cotton california recounted i bore the three children and did washing and ironing for some of my neighbors sometimes i was also a wet nurse i was very sad once when one of my criados a child i breastfed was taken from my breast because his father did not want to pay me any longer the baby died of hunger not much later they tried to have him suck on a goat teat i would have fed him with without money for a little food to help my little ones. Seeking some measure of economic security, railroad workers on, in Silvis, Illinois, saved enough money to buy land that no one else, there we go, wanted at the west end of town. These men had a rel relatively stable jobs in the repair shop on the Rock Island Railroad. 
After years of migrating on the Rock Island rails, Felix Vesquez would also secure employment as a bolt maker at the Silvis plant, for, and for 10 years, he, would, he and his family would call Silvis home. Recalling the close-knit nature of the community, his daughter, Uspia, stated most people were real nice. They called each other Los Camparades. So she further explained that during the influenza epidemic of 1918, her father's her father organized a food drive to assist his afflicted neighbors. My father used to have a little wagon and every week he used to go to every house and pick up food to help the sick people. Mutual aid provide a cornerstone in the process of, his, of settlement among Mexican workers in the United States. It should be noted that not everyone participated in the sense of reciprocity. As evident in Gregora Sosa's narrative, however, like the frontier women described by Fo Fabiola Carbaza de Baca, we in We Feed Them Cactus. Mexicanos, whether in migrant camps, boxcar barrios, or mining towns, sought to exercise some control over their lives, often relying on one another for, for material and emotional support. The cultural construction of class can be dis discerned in the mining communities of southern Arizona and southern Colorado. Both locales had a mixed economy, mining towns next to the villages, with ranches and homesteads marking the landscape in, in songs my mother sang to me. Patricia Presidio Martin presents the oral na narratives of 10 Arizona women, women whose memories elusive elucidate the division of labor within families, as well as the layering of generations within a regional matrix. Furthermore, Martin's narrators demonstrate how women claimed a public space through expression of religious faith. Typical of working class Mexican and Mexican American households, the family served as the focus of production, whether from ranching or mining, family daughters were expected to perform a round of arduous chores. The labor of female kin, regardless of age, proved instrumental in ensuring the family's economic survival. Women preserved food for the winters, sold surplus commodities to neighbors, did laundry for Euro-American Euro employers, and provided homes for lodges, lodgers. Like the pioneer form, mothers. They also herded livestock, milked cows, built fences, and harvested crops. A strict division of labor, according to gender, became blurred. Yet the seemingly egalitarian assignment of tasks in no way subverted the traditional notion of women's place before the break of dawn. Rosalia Salazar and her sisters would rise to gather kindling milk the cows and afterwards walk several miles to school, a, a routine that began, began with serving their families a cup of coffee. With fortitude, faith, and unsung courage, single mothers relied on their domestic skills to feed their children. Julia Islas Valles recalled how her mother, who came from a middle-class background in Mexico, peddled her handmade garments to poor Mexicanos. She did not have a formal education, but she was very smart. She had a little book she used to mark in wit what people owed her. She would draw a circle for a dollar and a half circle for 50 cents. Across Arizona and the Southwest, women participated in the informal economy of very, in various ways, lodging single miners in Superior, Arizona selling pan dolce door to door in San Bern Bernardino, or swapping sex for food in El Paso. Some relied on their healing skills as Carinda's healers and Parteva's midwives. Mexican women nurtured the networks essential for claiming a place in the United States. A layering of generations and peoples characterized rural Arizona. Mexicano migrants from Sonora homestead, homesteaded alongside Mexican Americans. Marriages occurred across generational and racial lines. Boarding houses brought people together. 
At Josefa's boarding house in Superior, for instance, a young Sonoran miner successfully courted Josefa, Arizona-born daughter, the oral hist histories in songs my mother sang to me reveal a multiracial agrar agrarian society. As an example, Rosalia Salazar was the child of a Mexican mother and a full-blooded Opata Indian father. She married Wilfred Whelan, whose mother, Ignacia, was Mexicana. In the center of this multiracial society was a distinctive Mexican-American agrarian culture, one that incorporated those willing to partake of it. Some Americanos attended fiestas, dances, and religious pageants. Assimilation was not a one-way street. In Southern Arizona, assimilation seemed to be thrown in reverse. Intermarriage did not guarantee the angelicization of the region's Spanish-speaking peoples. Many of the offspring of Mexican Anglo unions emphasize their Mexican rather than their Anglo heritage. Observed historian Thomas Sheridan, the reasons they did so testify to the enduring strength of a Mexican society in the face of Anglo political and economic hegemony one also has to take into account the class bridge, the Mexican Euro-American intermarriage occurring among those who owned property. The voices represented in songs point to an expensive Mexican cultural horizon in Southern Arizona where one's post-nationality or identity rested not in some essentialist biological mooring but through acceptance and adoption of mexican cultural values and expectations yet southern arizona was a stratified society complete with segregated schools and clearly demarcated american and mexican sides of mining towns i'll admit there is a lot of discrimination in those years declared carlotta silvis martin as she recalled growing up as a miner's daughter in mascot Dolores Montoya opened up a boarding house in the Euro-American section of the town. Decades, <clears throat> decades later, her daughter Esperanza would vividly recount the fear she felt as she recently widowed mother and her siblings were forced to abandon the family-run boarding house. The family, I'm sorry, Esperanza would vividly recount the fear as she felt as she, her recently widowed mother and her siblings were forced to, to abandon the family run boarding house in the face of systematic terror and harassment. In the dark of the night, someone kept turning the doorknob and separating the vines from the window, reaching a point of desperation. The family fled with only their clothing. After we left, whoever it was did a good job of robbing us. They took everything. <laughs> dishes, jewelry, furniture, anything of value, even the santos. Women relied on one another and on their faith. Religious practices permeated everyday routines in preparing the masa for the tortillas. Maria del Carmon Trejo de Gastelum would always add salt to the flour in the form of La Santa Cruz, the Holy Cross. Para Ben Declare, La Mesa, to bless the dough. With regard to education, the covenant of the sisters of the company of Mary Douglas, Arizona, served as a bulwark against the Americanization influences of a mining town. The nuns became teachers of both Catholic, Catholic, Catholicism and custom. Church Hamika's Saints Day and Mexican patriotic holidays constituted an integral part of Mex Arizona Mexican American agrarian, agrarian culture. Recalling the celebration of Los Posados, Carlota Silvas Martin observed Las Posadas are a reenactment of the travels of Joseph and Mary who are looking for a shelter. Before the birth of Jesus, large groups of men, women, and children walked in the procession through the darkened streets carrying candles. We'd arrive at a designated house and sing songs asking for the posada or lodging. Those inside 
would answer that there was no room. We'd go to several houses until we arrived at a chosen house. Then we'd go in and have food, chocolate, and pan de huevo and piñata full of candy. Las Posadas reaffirmed the practices of ritualized visiting among kin and friends. It seemed as much a celebration of community networks as religious journey. From a small home altar nestled atop a bureau dresser to a well-orchestrated town play or pageant, Mexicans in southern Arizona viewed their own interpretations as, of Catholicism as integral parts of their cultural life. Women also carved out a public cultural space in, the, in these community-based religious productions. Women's daily lives appear to corroborate Richard White's observation on the cultural construction of class. A self-conscious working class demands not just common labor, but also common sense of identity, a common set of interests, and a common set of values, arguing that ethnic sol solidarity often seemed more important than the working class solidarity. White maintained that Western mining towns often seemed a collection of separation, uh, separate ethnic working class communities whose overarching class consciousness was tentative and fragile when it, it existed at all. While racial cultural boundaries could blur in Arizona agri agrarian communities, in Southern Colorado, ethnic boundaries appear relatively fixed with racial class divisions cropping up within Spanish, within groups of Spanish speaking workers. Born in Walsenburg, Colorado in 1921, Arminio Ruiz was considered the daughter of a mixed marriage. Her father was a Mexican immigrant. Her mother, a Hispania, born in nearby Trinidad. She remembered that Mexican Union families, those associated with the industrial workers of the world, tended to stick together on Saturday night. They would gather at someone's house for music, food, dancing, and fellowship. All the neighbors got together. You'd have dancing and they put all of the chairs out and the ladies would bake pies and cakes during the Columbine strike of 1927. Erminia had little contact with her mother's side of the family as her uncles were scabs. We were in a way closer to our neighbors. She also remembered attending union meetings with her father sitting on his knee and listening to all the languages spoken around her. There she learned to sing her first song in English, Solidarity Forever. Her personal story correlates with Sarah Deutsch, Deutsch's analysis of the ways in which ethnic, uh, excuse me, and regional identities in New Mexico and Colorado reconfigure class consciousness within separate communities. Whether they lived in a camp, village, or city, Mexican women carved a place for themselves and their families based on shared experiences, cultural traditions, histories, and concerns. They relied on one another as family members and as neighbors, whether they lived in a tightly knit rural colonia or a rolling box carburillo. Yet as we have been, or yet as we have seen patriarchy and even class distinctions existed, families could be a source of strength uh, or a source of trial, but the range of their lives and their struggles seemed lost on the American public. Growing native, Na nativist sentiment during the 1920s and 1930s began to blame Mexican immigrants for the society's ills. A Mexican expert from Bander Vanderbilt Ex University, Dr. Roy Garris, testified before a U.S. Congressional Committee. He reiterated the views of a Euro-American West Westerner, a man who claimed that Mexican women were instinctively prone to adultery. Relaying this questionable third-party testimony, Garris recapulate, recapitulated the tired, trite, and grotesque 19th century gendered racialized stereotypes for modern audience. A portion follows. Their minds running, run 
to nothing higher than animal functions, eat, sleep, and sexual debauchery. In every huddle of Mexican shucks, one meets the same idleness, filthy children with faces plastered with flies, disease, lice, apathetic peons, and lazy squaws. These sentiments are, were not isolated extremist meanderings. With a circulation of nearly 3 million, the Saturday Evening Post ran a series of articles urging the restriction of Mexican immigration. The titles tell the story. The Mexican Invasion, Wet and Other Mexicans, and the, quote, The Alien on Relief. One article, The Docile Mexican, characterized Mexicano immigrants with the following adjectives illiterate, diseased, pauperized, relying on mixed metaphors as well as the opinions of scientists who dabbled in eugenics. The author, Kenneth Roberts, refers to Mexicans as both white elephants and as people who bring countless number of American citizens into the world with the reckless prodigality of rabbits. Robert cautious, cautions against the mo mongrelization of America, warning further that the children of Mexican and Euro-American Euro parents will result in another mixed race problem. And as so soon as a race is mixed, it is inferior and under the heading of, quote, the Mexican conquest, the editor of the Saturday Evening Post offered his opinion on June 22nd, 1929 issue the very high Mexican birth rate tends to depress still further the low white birth rate. Thus, a race problem of the greatest magnitude is being allowed to develop the, for future generations to regret. And in spite of the fact that the Mexican Indian is considered a most undesirable ethnic sh stock for the melting pot. <clears throat> With the onset of the Great Depression, rhetoric exploded into action between, I'm so sorry, between 1931 to 1934, an estimated one third of Mexican population in the United States, over 500,000 people, were either deported or repatriated to Mexico, even though the majority were native U.S. citizens. Mexicans were the only immigrants tar targeted for removal. Proximity to the Mexican border, the physical distinctiveness of mestizos and easily identifiable burritos influenced immigration and social welfare of officials to focus their efforts solely on the Mexican people, who people whom they viewed as both foreign and Serpers of American jobs and as unworthy burdens on relief roles. From Los Angeles, California to Gary, Indiana, Mexicans were either summarily deported by immigration agencies or persuaded to deport, depart voluntarily by duplicitous social workers who greatly exaggerated the opportunities awaiting them south of the border. In the words of George Sanchez, as many as 75,000 Mexicans from Southern California returned to Mexico by 1932. The enormity of these figures, given the fact that California's Mexican population was in 1930 slightly over 360,000, indic indicates that almost every Mexican family in Southern California confronted in one way or another the decision of returning or staying. Francisco Bald Baldrama and Raymond Rodriguez placed the dis deportation and repatriation figures even higher, drawing on statistics from both U.S. and Mexican government agencies, as well as newspaper reports. They contend that one million Mexicanos were repatriated or deported during the 1920s and 1930s. Moreover, they noted that approximately 60% were children who had been born in the United States. The methods of departure varied. A historian of Los Angeles, Douglas Monroy, recounts how La Maguilla trolled the burrito in a dog catcher's wagon. Unquote. In one instance, immigration agents tore a Los Angeles woman from her home in the early morning hours, threw her in the wagon, and, and then left her toddler screaming on the front porch. 
Even if such scenes were far, few and far between, they certainly invoke fear among Mexicanos, many of whom decided to take the country, the county up on its offer of tree fr free train fare. Carrie Williams McWilliams described those boarding a repatriation train as men, women, and children with dogs, cats, and goats with half-open suitcases. Rolls of bedding and lunch baskets. Thousands more chose to leave by automobile. They piled all their possessions, mattresses, furniture, clothing into a jalopy and headed south. This scene of auto caravans making their way to into the inferior of Mexico offers a curious parallel to the ensuing Dust Bowl or Oki migration to, into California. Losing one child and struggling to support the other, Jesuita Torres held on to her place in the United States. She refused to apply for relief because she and her mother wanted to escape the the notice of government authorities. My mother said it was no use for us to go back. To what? We did not have anything out there, unquote. Describing the reputation of two friends, she further remarked, we are sorry that they left, but because both of the ladies of the husbands left them in Mexico with their children, it was pretty hard for them. Jesuita survived the depression by picking berries and string beans around Los Angeles and following the crops in this San Joaquin Valley. From her wages, she raised a family and brought a house when she purchased for $17. Petra Sanchez had no choice. By the fall of 1933, Petra and Ramon appear to have built a nice life for themselves in Buena Park. With the money they picked from, picking bear, from berry picking and manure hauling, combined with Petra's frugal budgeting, the couple had leased a small ranch from 1926 to 1933. Their family grew from four children to ten, according to Marjorie Sanchez Walker. Even with a new baby arriving every 15 minutes, I'm sorry, every 15 months, Petra still found the time to supplement the family's needs from her industry. industry. Chicken provided eggs and meat that she could sell when the, there was surplus. Her garden produced vegetables. She made cheeses, which, which hung over the dining table. And in the summer, she picked berries for wages. Petra found she could not keep up this place. In November 1933, she suffered a nervous breakdown and was committed in committed to the Norwalk State Mental Hospital. By Christmas, Petra, her health seemingly restored, would be home with her family again. But her home home now has but home now was her children childhood village in San Julian. Coming under the scrutiny of relief, authorities Ramon believed that if the family left voluntarily, they could return at a later date. However, his papers bore at the stump, bore the stamp, Los Angeles County Department of Charities, County Welfare Department. The family now bore the onus of liable to become a public charge, unquote, and thus ineligible for readmission. Repatriation, <clears throat> therefore, amounted to deportation for Petra and Ramon. In 1935, hoping to return to California, the couple and their 11 children, with another one on the way, traveled to Ciudad Juarez. There, they, they were turned away at the border with money running low. Ramon sh shaved his mustache, borrowed money for a second-hand suit, and with his green eyes and fair skin, simply walked across the border. He planned to earn enough money for picking berries in Buena Park to secure his family's clandestine passage to the United States. The children supported the family, the boys by shining shoes, selling trinkets and lagging pennies, and the girls by running errands for neighbors, six-year-old Juan acted as a tour guide for U.S. Army personnel on the prowl for a good time in the red light district and for his labor received tips from both soldiers and prostitutes. 
The deprivation in Ciudad Juarez was well known. The New York Times carried a story of how over 20 repatriates had died from pneumonia and exposure without resources or shelter as many as 2000 lived in open and lived in large open corral with hunger a constant companion petra gave birth to a daughter catalina but the infant would die in juarez 15 months later her coffin hand made by her brother la Burita. petra held her children together under the most adverse circumstances 1937, the family was reunited in California, but Ramon and Petra would never regain the level of financial security they had known living on their leased Buena Park Ranch. After 1934, the deportation and reputation campaigns diminished, but the effects of the depression, segregation, and economic segmentation remained. Even members of the middle class Mexican-American community were not immune. During the 1930s and 1940s, the League <clears throat> of United Latin American Citizens, LULAC, led the fight to, for school desegregation in the courts <clears throat> at the household level. Maintaining appearances proved important with no money for Cole Eduardo Areza, who owned a small auto repair shop in El Paso, brought home rubber tires to burn in the fireplace. As his daughter Alma related, you kept up appearances even though your stomach grumbled. The border journey of Mexican women were fraught with unforeseen difficulties, but held out the promises of a better life. In the words of one Mexicana, here women has come to have a place like a human being. Women built communities of resiliency, drawing strengths from their comadres, their families and their faith confronting America often meant <clears throat> mean confronting labor contractor, the boss, the landlord, or la, mag la migra. It could also involve negotiating the settlement house, the grammar school, and the health cl clinic. State and church sponsored Americanization projects could pretend cultural hegemony, individual empowerment, vocational tracking, community service, or all four simultaneously to get at how Mexicanos and their children traversed the terrain of Americanization in negotiating institutions and ideologies. A case study seems appropriate. The Rose Gregory Houchin Settlement House in El Paso, Texas emphasized Christian Americanization while furnishing social services denied Mexicans in the public sector. A historical survey of this Methodist settlement reveals much about how women, especially as mothers and daughters, claim portions of Americanization within their own cultural frames. This is the end of chapter one. Thank you.